Hey folks, welcome to a new video. I am super excited about our conversation today. We are headed for a deep dive on inner critics, that negative voice in your head that tends to pop up during some of the most unhelpful times in your creative practice. It's a favorite topic of mine because it's something that I have really struggled with personally. Uh, we're going to address some common myths, some uh, tripping points that end up causing problems for a lot of us, and ultimately we'll unpack kind of two very different approaches for dealing with your inner critic with lots of specific techniques and actionable steps thrown in there. So uh, before we dive into that, a brief word from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Learn with Kendall, my a la carte online education platform hosted by Teachable. If you prefer to buy classes a la carte rather than signing up for a subscription, this is the place for you. You can buy my individual art classes and have access to them whenever you want without paying a monthly fee. I'm super excited to launch the Draw Anything Bundle on Learn with Kendall. This is a collection of my three foundational drawing courses that cover everything from proportions to shading to color. If you're a beginner or if you're new to realism, this is a really great place to start. It also also has a bonus real-time demo that incorporates all the techniques from all three classes uh, with a step-by-step real-time explanation. This bundle is available exclusively on Learn with Kendall. You can find the Draw Anything bundle at learnwithkendall.teachable.com and of course there is a link in the description box. Okay, so I want to say up front at the start of the video that I will be borrowing quite a bit from the work of somebody named Dr. Russ Harris, who is a psychotherapist from the UK. Dr. Harris wrote the book, The Happiness Trap, which is kind of like a layperson's guide to something called ACT. ACT is actually an acronym, which stands for Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. And it's a super widely studied and used technique, um, a clinical technique that's used to help folks who struggle with anxiety. Um, and sometimes folks who struggle with anxiety on like a pretty profound, uh, life impacting level and act as something, a particular modality, a particular uh, approach to therapy that is used to help them improve their quality of life. Now, uh, at this point, as I say all of that, don't run away, please. Um, I can imagine that maybe you're saying, oh, this is a psychology channel all of a sudden. You know, I didn't realize that. I'm just here to get rid of my inner critic. I'm just here to, you know, help with some of that inner critical voice. Uh, but before you turn off this video, please remember that your inner critic is rooted in your feelings. And most of the advice be it helpful or unhelpful about how to deal with that inner critic is at its core advice about how to deal with negative feelings. So we are going to talk a lot about feelings in this video, but I promise you it will be relevant to your uh, inner critic and most importantly to your art practice. All right, so let's get to it. ACT is a science-backed clinical methodology. I am obviously not a clinician. I have adapted terms, labels, and wording, in some cases significantly, to translate approaches that deal with broader feelings to specific negative feelings that many artists and creative people struggle with, centered around their artistic practice and inner critic. If you would like to learn more about ACT, there will be links to Dr. Harris and his work in the description box. And of course, none of this should be taken as mental health advice. If you or someone you know is experiencing debilitating anxiety, please call the National Alliance on Mental Illness Helpline at 1-800-950-6264. Okay, so we're going to start by talking about some common first-line approaches for dealing with your inner critic. In ACT, Russ Harris calls these control strategies. The main idea with all of these approaches is that they allow you to kind of try to work around or control your inner critic in some way. So I'll list these off and then give a few examples of each one. Control strategy number one, ignore. So some of the advice that you may have heard around this one would be like, you know, just ignore your inner critic, keep making them work anyway, you know, just act like it's not there. Uh, number two, to distract. Advice around this might be, you know, to focus on the positive or repeat an affirming mantra to yourself or maybe, you know, visualize the kind of art practice you want and focus on that instead of on what your inner critic is saying. Number three, Three, to confront. This one would be like, you know, to argue with your inner critic or um, take a, a negative thought that you have and counter that with a positive thought or, you know, maybe 10 positive thoughts. Or another popular one here is to, you know, come up with a list of evidence that proves your inner critic wrong. Uh, number four is to outwit. And this would be like to, you know, work around your inner critic in some way or to try a easier, less intimidating art making approach or maybe even work at a different time of day when your inner critic isn't so loud. Now, all of these strategies, all four of these have the their own utility in certain circumstances. They can be useful and they may even allow you to quiet your inner critic for long enough to actually make work. I'm not just, you know, sitting here dumping all over these and saying that they have no value. In fact, strategy number four is really my own personal favorite and you probably have heard it on this channel because basically every video I have ever made about how important it is to tap into a process that you can be present in and enjoy is a version of that strategy. It's a version of strategy number four, the outwit strategy. I'd even go so far as to say that if you think 
think you have an inner critic problem stopping you from making work, make sure that the real problem isn't just that you do not enjoy the work that you're trying to make or that you're trying to make work that just isn't realistic for your life right now. Uh, so each of these tactics, as I've said, has their place. And certainly if they're working for you and they're allowing you to take action and make work, if you're doing the things that you want to do, if you want to make art and you're actually making art uh, and these tactics are part of the way that you're doing it, if they're helping you, then keep using them. You know, by all means, keep doing what's working for you. Uh, but you may reach a point where they stop working for you. Or maybe, you know, if you're watching this video, you're already at that point. Uh, maybe it's because you're stressed emotionally. Maybe you're tackling something in some other area of your life that's more challenging. Or maybe it's, you know, specifically more challenging related to your artwork. Maybe you feel out of your depth or uncertain in some way. Um, in my personal experience, my inner critic uh, tends to be much harder to control in those types of circumstances. Those are, you know, when my inner critic tends to be at its strongest. So uh, one particular circumstance that continues to make my inner critic very loud is when I'm working on a client project uh, with a deadline and you know maybe an art director that I don't know or that I haven't worked with before and a type of subject that I'm not familiar with or is out of my comfort zone that is basically like the perfect storm for for me for my inner critic to kind of take over and in that situation I can't use my favorite control strategy I can't use that number four the, the strategy of outwitting because I have to accomplish the task at hand I can't just pick an easy easier task or a more approachable task. And, you know, oftentimes I can't even decide to work at a different time of day because I'm on a deadline. Uh, and then strategies one through three don't really work for me either because they basically just require that I would, you know, white knuckle it in a battle of wills against my inner critic. And if you have tried to do that, you know that when you're fighting your inner critic, you're fighting against hundreds of thousands of years of human evolution. Your brain has evolved to think this way. There's a reason it thinks this way. And your inner critic is fun fundamentally at a baseline level just doing its job. So it's a little like trying to kind of hold back the tide, especially if you're already spread thin emotionally in other ways or if you have a particularly loud inner critic to begin with. Now that amount of effort, just gritting your teeth and willing yourself to do something, to push through something, is just not always going to be sustainable for all of us all of the time. And as a result, there are going to be a lot of creative people who will end up in a pinch or you know maybe even regularly using a fifth control strategy to do deal with their inner critic. And that fifth control strategy is to retreat or avoid. So this one is really pretty sad because it means ultimately that rather than continue to struggle with their inner critic day after day, they'll decide simply to stop the behavior, the art making, that is upsetting their inner critic in the first place. And again, if you are somebody who's regularly making art or you know whatever your creative outlet is, music or crochet or whatever it is, and you're using one of these control strategies and it's working for you. And uh, what I mean by working for you is that it's not allowing your inner critic to stop you from doing the things that you have decided that you want to do, that is great. Keep doing what's working for you. Uh, but if you are frequently using that fifth control strategy, if you're giving up on projects or, you know, uh, abandoning things, saying no to opportunities, um, letting go of ideas that you wanted to explore before you've even really given them a chance because your inner critic is so loud and so powerful, then stick around and we will dig into our second approach for dealing with an inner critic, particularly one um, that is super powerful or strong or, you know, having a, <laughs> a really peak day because of what's going on in the rest of your life and, you know, it's making your inner critic more persistent. So stick around. We will dive into that in just a second. Okay, before we can get into the specific techniques here, and there are some very specific actionable techniques, we need to first address one kind of core unhelpful assumption about your inner critic that many of us carry around and we just kind of take for granted. And that is the idea that your inner critic is in your control or, you know, 100% in your control. And that is just flatly not true. We do have a lot of control over the things that we do, over our actions, but the reality is that we have much less control than we would like over our emotions and our feelings, especially when the stakes are very high, so which I would define that as like, you know, we care a lot or there's a lot of things riding on it, or when there are other kind of negative emotions already at play. Now, negative feelings, if you, I'm sure you know this already at some level, but let me just say this again so that, you know, you can hear it and um, really try to uh, accept it and let yourself off the hook a little bit. Negative feelings are a normal part of the human condition. And in fact, Russ Harris says that up to 80% of human thoughts have some kind of negative content in them. So it's really normal to feel anxious or uncomfortable when you're trying to do something that's unfamiliar, something you care a lot about, or in which there's a great deal of uncertainty. Negative feelings in those circumstances are normal. 
You can't eliminate these thoughts and you can't eliminate your inner critic. That's not what these techniques are going to be about. Uh, but the good news is, even though it's present, even though it's there and you can't, you know, control it or wrestle it down or totally get rid of it, you don't need to do that. All you need to do is learn how to take meaningful action towards the things that actually matter to you, which is what we're going to unpack next. All right, so now we're going to go over six techniques to try when you are in the grip of a very strong inner critic who doesn't seem to move ground with any of the control strategies that we reviewed earlier. Some of these are great for when you're in the moment, when you're like really struggling with your inner critic in a tense moment, um, you know, while you're trying to create work and you're feeling, you know, stopped by your inner critic. And then some of them are things that you're going to want to do at other times when you're a little bit more calm, when you're not really in the heat of the moment, um, that you'll build up those techniques to, to get stronger and get better at dealing with your inner critic when you are in a stressful situation. So these techniques are all adapted from ACT and they are so much more in depth if you get into the actual practice of ACT. So hopefully you'll be able to get a sense for how helpful they can be in your creative practice and in other areas of your life too. For me, they, they really have been pretty transformational. Uh, so, you know, whether you look it up online, read more about it online, or whether you get Dr. Harris's book, The Happiness Trap, um, yeah, hopefully you'll get a sense just in the, this little taste test here of how um, helpful this can be. And, and I really honestly do recommend it. So here are um, six tactics to, to try, six practices to try when you are dealing with a really strong inner critic. Number one, thoughts are just thoughts. So pick a thought that's related to your art practice that is particularly troubling to you. Ideally, this would be one that comes up again and again and tends to paralyze you or stop you from making work in some way. So to give you an example of this, some of my inner critics' greatest hits include things like, I'm no good with backgrounds, or if I were a real artist, I would do X, Y, Z. Or, you know, the, the favorite one that comes up pretty much after any time I finish a client project that maybe felt a little bit bumpy or out of my comfort zone, no one will ever hire me again. These are just mine. Uh, yours may be similar or very different. Um, try to take a moment, and you know, maybe this would be a better one to do when you're not in the heat of the moment, um, but try to take some time and come up with one of those phrases that you find particularly troubling. You can even do it right now if you want to give it a try. Uh, and take that phrase and picture it in your mind. And when I say picture it, I mean like physically picture it, like the actual words. Imagine what they look like, the letters that are involved in the words. Um, try to describe them. You know, where are they? Where do you see them in space? Are they in front of you? Are they above you? Are they behind you? What does the font look like? What color are they? What's around it? The aim of this practice is to learn to perceive that troubling recurring idea uh, as nothing more than what it actually is, which is just some words and snippets in a story that's flowing through the endless story and word generating machine that is your brain. So this upsetting idea, however disturbing it is, however persistent it is, it's not a fact. It's just a collection of words. All right, tactic number two, make room for your inner critic. So bring to mind one of those troubling ideas from the first exercise. Maybe you can hang on to that same one that you were just working with now, or you can imagine a particularly anxiety producing situation, like kind of what I described with, you know, the, the client's situation, the out of my depth client situation. So bring to mind one of those troubling ideas from the first exercise. You could just keep working with that same one that you have in your head now, or you could imagine a particularly anxiety producing situation. For example, you know, maybe being partway through a piece, uh, maybe a piece that's on a deadline and feeling like it's terrible or going nowhere and just feeling really stuck and wanting to give up. Whatever situation tends to throw you off balance the most or the, the situation that's the most common for you to give up in that, that will actually stop you from making work. Try to imagine yourself in that situation and then sit in that feeling for a moment. Sit in the feelings that come up for, for a moment and ask yourself, try to try to figure out where those feelings are in your body, physically where they are in your body. You know, for me, I tend to feel them like kind of right up here, right in like in between my stomach and my throat. Acknowledge that it's there and then take some breaths, do some breathing exercises, try to breathe into that feeling. This is going to sound very woo-woo, um, but uh, it really has been helpful for me. So that's part of why I want to share it for you here. Um, try to breathe into that feeling and make space for it. Even though you don't want it there, just try to picture your, your physical body wherever you feel that feeling. Try to picture it getting bigger and more spacious, making space for some of those feelings to exist, even though you wish they weren't there. What you're aiming for here is some version of acceptance. Now, acceptance doesn't mean that you lay down and meekly accept that you're a terrible artist who will never paint backgrounds. According to Dr. Harris, acceptance means opening up and making room for the difficult thoughts and feelings that are guaranteed to show up whether you choose to do the hard thing or not. So whether you choose to paint or not. Now, when I imagine how this looks in real life, I kind of like to picture my inner critic as a toddler having a tantrum. So I would treat that toddler with compassion and acceptance of their feelings, but I wouldn't let their emotions dictate what we choose to do next. 
And that's uh, an analogy that I have a lot of experience with because I happen to have two toddlers in my life who do have tantrums a lot. And I can tell you that thinking of my inner critic in the same way that I think of my children when they're in the middle of a tantrum has really helped me to kind of expand and accept a little bit more and have a bit more compassion for my inner critic. All right, number three, I think we're on number three. <laughs> number three is to reconnect with the present. So once you've done all that, try bringing your attention back to what you are literally doing in this moment. So feel your feet on the ground, your butt in your chair, your hand, uh, your fingers holding the pencil, your hand against the paper, whatever physical sensations are around you, whatever you are literally doing in the moment, connecting with your physical self in this way and bringing attention to, back to the present moment allows you to be more open to what you are actually doing while still holding space for your inner critic. So this practice is much easier in stressful times if you also practice it regularly at other times. So this is something probably a lot of you have heard of, but some sort of mindfulness meditation um, can be very helpful in, in expanding that ability. So a great beginning resource for this, something that was kind of my doorway into mindful, mindfulness meditation back in the day was the Tangerine Meditation by Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, I will link that as well in the description box, but really any mindfulness practice can really help you with, um, with that tactic, with that practice of getting reconnected to the present moment when you're in the grip of your inner critic or any kind of negative feeling. Number four, become the observer. So here you are gonna kind of even further distance yourself from the story that your inner critic is telling you. So rather than saying, you know, I'm no good with background, say to yourself, I'm having the thought that I'm no good at backgrounds. And you can even add another layer of separation between yourself and that idea by saying, I notice that my brain is having the thought that I'm not good at backgrounds. Um, and this is something, again, that probably sounds like way too simple, way too basic. When I first read The Happiness Trap and I first read about that practice, I remember kind of rolling my eyes and thinking like, what like how big of a difference can that actually make? And it can make a huge difference. <laughs> it is w one of the practices, I think of these six that we're talking about, this is the one that in the moment has made the biggest difference for me. So when I am like, actually in a crisis moment of feeling like I've got to quit. This is too overwhelming. I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm not good enough. I don't have what it takes. Like when I'm really stuck in that mind rut, this practice is the, is the one that has helped me most to be able to just notice the fact that I'm in a mind rut enough to actually get out of it. So of, if you, if you take nothing else away personally for me, I feel like this is the one that is, that is the most powerful in terms of like a rescue strategy in the tough moment. Um, when you're dealing with your inner critic, of course, all these other ones, you know, actually building up your ability, you know, through, you know, consistent mindfulness practice, actually building up your ability to, you know, make space for those negative feelings, kind of holding intention, the negative feelings and the present moment. That's all so important. Um, but just try this tactic, try this tactic that we're talking about here. The next time you're, you're in a pinch, the next time your inner critic has you. Um, one other thing that, that Russ Harris recommends around this practice, um, that again is going to sound silly, um, but I'm going to try to demo it for you. <laughs> is to after you've kind of created those verbal that verbal distance between your inner critic and you you know going from saying you know I'm no good at backgrounds to saying I notice my brain is having the thought that I'm no good at backgrounds you can sing that <laughs> so pick out uh, some kind of silly tune I think one of the ones he suggests is happy birthday um, I don't think I've ever sung on this channel so this is going to be a first but I'm going to try to <laughs> sing it for you now so it would be like um I noticed that my brain is having the thought that my inner critic is no, no, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I noticed that my brain is having the thought that I'm no good at backgrounds. <laughs> I noticed that my brain is having the thought that I'm no good at backgrounds. And it really does, <laughs> you can see like I'm laughing as I do it. Part of that is because I'm embarrassed and I don't typically do this kind of thing on this channel. Um, but it really helps in the moment too. Just kind of, it, it, it brings it home that this idea is nothing more than an idea. It's not it's not objective truth. It's just this thing that's coming into your brain right now. And your brain tends to like to do that. Your brain tells this story over and over again. It's just a really good idea to get you a really good practice for getting you in touch with that. All right, we'll move on to the next one. All right, number five, tap into your why. So here's where you want to remind yourself why you wanted to make art in the first place and why that is an important thing for you. This is really another practice that needs work outside of the crisis moment. So spend some time, you know, maybe today, 
maybe right now, maybe after you finish watching this video, you can pull out your journal, spend some time thinking about why it's important for you to make art. So Russ Harris defines values as a direction that you desire to keep moving in. Uh, so even if it's a very simple feeling, even if it's a very simple desire, like, you know, I paint because I want to paint, that is a direction, that is a value, that's something that's important to you. So uh, spend some time reflecting on what those are. And also, if you're pretty new at this, if you're you know fairly new um, in terms of developing an art practice, keep in mind that your values around art, the why behind why you do this, will deepen and clarify with time, especially as you continue in your practice. Um, but for me, just so you have an idea of what they can be, I can say that my values are a love of the process for its own sake, um, a desire to challenge myself and grow both as a creative person and just as a human being, uh, a longing for connection and communication, and the number four, a desire to support my family. Um, so it's important, again, to do this reflection ahead of time because when you're in the moment, when you're in the grip of your inner critic, you need to be able to pull on something. You need to have that deep anchor already in the ground that you can kind of reconnect with. If you're just in the grip in the moment and you don't know why it's important to you, it's very, it can be very hard to remember. So try to spend some time reflecting on this. Come up with at least, you know, one or two that you feel like are, you know, really true for you that you could tell yourself in the moment once you've done some of these other practices, maybe once you've sung your, your thought that keeps coming up over and over again, your unhelpful thought. Um, then after you're like, okay, yes, I, I am in a mind rut. This is what's happening. Um, and you know, you're reconnecting with the present moment, your physical body, then you can kind of like reach for those values. You can reach for your why and remind yourself why, why is it important for you to keep going even though you're experiencing some form of suffering, even though this is really hard, why is it important for you to keep going? Now, having that anchor ahead of time, it's just gonna make it so much easier for you to really rely on that, for it to be a source of strength as you move into tactic number six, um, and that is to commit to the making. So once you're in touch with your values, those, those things that motivate you, the why behind your art making, you can decide to set some specific goals that connect with those values. And again, this is something you probably want to do outside of the crisis moment. Um, for example, if you want to grow and challenge yourself, if that's one of your values is, is growth and challenging yourself like mine, um, you might decide to take on increasingly technically more difficult projects. Um, but on the other hand, if your values around art are that it allows you to express unverbalized feelings, it's, it's more a tool of communication and self-expression, um, then your goals might have more to do with how emotionally honest and brave you're willing to be in your work. And of course, those two things could overlap. Um, your, your goals, your values around art making are going to be very unique to you. Now, once you have done all of these things, even if you get, you know, kind of pretty practice in all of them and all six of these tactics, and you've done some of the things that require preparation ahead of time, and then you're using the rescue strategies in the moment, your inner critic may still be singing that same song about, you know, how you can't paint backgrounds or that you have nothing original to say, or that you don't have the it factor, whatever that is. And those thoughts will likely still be uncomfortable. They're, you're not gonna take the discomfort out of this equation. The goal is not to avoid discomfort. And that is avoiding discomfort, avoiding suffering in the creative practice is not possible. The only way to do that is to not make any art. And to me, um, when I look at that possibility, I realize that that will result in even more suffering um, because art making, is a calling for me. And if it is for you too, if you're watching this video, I'm guessing you resonate with some form of that. So recognizing that that is going to be, that discomfort is going to be a part of the, the equation, whether or not, the, the only way it will not be part of the equation is if you deny the call, as if you say, I'm not going to even answer that. I'm not going to even attempt the creative process. And that will have its own kind of cost, its own kind of suffering. So the goal with all of these practices is to transition from being completely captive to your inner critic and not taking action on your values, not making art, not doing the things that you really want to do, but that you find frightening in some way, to transition from that to being a neutral observer who can take action. And once you're no longer trying to wrestle it away or fight with your inner critic, um, you'll realize that you're expending a huge amount of energy when you do that. And if you're no longer trying to do that, you can put more of your mental and emotional energy into deciding to take action on the things that you actually really want to do in the first place, which is making art, the creative process, um, putting, putting your voice into something, putting that out into the world. One last note before we wrap up here. Um, the point of engaging with your inner critic in this way 
is not so that you can learn to strong arm yourself into doing something that doesn't align with what you actually want in life, something that doesn't align with your values. So if you are not sure about what your artistic values are, if step five in this process that we just reviewed made you kind of scratch your head and think, gosh, like I actually don't know why I do this. Like what is motivating me? Like what is the why behind um, my artistic practice? Um, if you have no idea what your artistic direction is, I would recommend watching my video about finding your process, um, which will be linked Linked on the screen and in the description box or taking my class the scientific method for artists which I will also have linked in the description box so that you can get clear about your values first you don't want to go through all of this with your inner critic all of this deep reflection and um, work <laughs> into uh, into a process so that you can you know do realistic portraits when you what you really want when the direction that actually aligns with your values the direction that you really want to go in is abstract landscapes so I would say um, gently <laughs> gently suggest try to find your direction first, find the process that you enjoy engaging in first, and then start challenging your limits with your inner critic. Uh, I hope this video was helpful. Again, if you want to learn more about ACT and Russ Harris, check the link in the description box. Thank you so much to my patrons for sponsoring this channel and for sponsoring this video. Um, thank you to Meg for editing. Thank you to you for watching. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. Um, share it with somebody who you think might find it helpful. Um, leave any questions in the comment section. <laughs> and that's it. I hope you have a great week. Hope you make some art and I will see you next time. Bye.